That was a good thing in that it served me well and prepared me for the drastic changes in my young life that were soon to come. The other thing I learned, more importantly, was the importance of having an equalizer, a weapon. As long as I had some kind of weapon, I wasn't afraid of anybody. That would turn out to be important because throughout my life, as you know, I turned out to be a gang member and a leader specializing in weapons and guerrilla warfare. But I think it all started right there that day when I hit that kid as hard as I could with that stick and I saw the results. Also, just to throw it out there, the next day that kid's father had the nerve to come out to our house complaining to my father about what I had done. My father just told him, hey, your son has been bullying everybody and said that he had told me to do what I did and that if that kid's father didn't get off his property and go home, that he would be going home in an ambulance because my father was going to beat him up. Well, the kid's father just left and we never heard from him again. So now, here was this 10 year old sort of cousin being released from juvenile hall to come live with us. And he was a bully too. He would say nasty things and use cursing language about my babysitter Annie. He would say how he was gonna fuck her and suck her big titties. And how he just knew Annie had a big hairy pussy and stuff like that. See, this is what I'm talking about, man. I was so innocent, I didn't even know what any of that really meant. I just knew that they were dirty by the evil way he said them. I would tell him to stop talking like that about Annie and we'd get into a fight. One day, both of our mothers heard us fighting over Annie. This time, Annie happened to be there. I told my mother all the things David had been saying about Annie. David called me a liar and tried to rush me. We were rolling around together on the living room floor fighting when our parents said that they had had enough of our fighting. My mother grabbed me and David's mother grabbed him and they told us that since we couldn't get along, we were gonna have to go outside in front of everybody and have it out once and for all. Now remember, I was six. He was 10 and much bigger than me. So my mother must have had confidence in me. This time there would be no stick in my hand to help me. And this time my mother had a big belt, as did David's mother. They were whipping us to make us fight each other. And worst of all, all the other kids were watching us fight, including Annie. To lose and get my butt kicked in front of Annie would be too embarrassing to me. I did not understand why my mother was whipping me. I was her pride and joy. I looked at her and I said, Mama, why are you hitting me? Why are you making me do this? I'll never forget what she told me. She said, you don't ever quit a fight. Once you start it, you finish it. Well, right then, I realized that the only way I was gonna get my mama to stop hitting me was to knock this kid out. I don't know how I did it. I just knew I had to take him out. I charged him, swinging as hard as I could. I knocked him out and I knocked him smooth out, unconscious. Everybody that was there was cheering for me because nobody liked David. Even the 10 year old girl Cecilia and Annie too. Everybody knew that fight was over Annie and that I was defending her honor. After the fight, Annie came and she hugged me and kissed me, crushing my head against her big young breasts. I was in heaven. I didn't know what all this stuff meant. All I knew was that being crushed against Annie's big breast and having her kissing me and praising me felt so good. She was talking about how I was her knight in shining armor, defending her honor and all that. But I saw how Cecilia looked at me. She had a new look in her eyes towards me and I didn't even understand what it was. One Saturday morning, I was waiting for Joey. I was sitting on my front step waiting for him to come. He's going to take me to a new go-kart he built and we were going to go driving all over the place in it. Instead, around the corner came Cecilia. She started talking to me and right away I was suspicious. This girl's never liked me. She's always been mean to me. So I asked where Joey was. She answered, oh, Joey can't come today. Joey's got to do something. He had to go somewhere. He wasn't going to be able to come play with me. I was like, oh man, no go-karts? I was really looking forward to it. She told me, you wanna play with me? And I was like, why would I wanna play with you? You don't even like me. 
and you're a girl. She said, no, I'll give you a puppet show. Come with me. So she promised me a puppet show. She took me into this big barn and made sure it's all locked up. She sat me on a bale of hay. I was sitting there. I was waiting for the puppet show and she told me to close my eyes. Next thing I know, she started taking off her clothes. Here we go again. She took all her clothes off and she was standing there naked in front of me. I had a lot of girl cousins and I had seen them naked because we would always bathe together. It never impressed me one way or the other. I did notice the difference with Cecilia because she had already started growing pubic hair. <laughs> and she had begun to have little breasts. That was different. Still, I was waiting for the puppets. I asked her, where's the puppets? She told me, there are no puppets. I brought you in here to show you a dance. I'm gonna dance for you. I was heartbroken. All I could keep saying was, no puppets? Man, where's the puppets? No puppets? She was like, no, I brought you in here so you could look at me. And I looked at her because she said, look at me. So I was looking at her and like I said, I noticed the differences. I still was not really impressed, but then she started to do this little kind of dance. She turned her back to me, she bent over, and she started moving her butt in my face, literally inches from my face. For the first time in my life, I felt something in my groin. I felt something in my blood I'd never felt before. Next thing I know, I had this erection. I was like, wow. This feeling I'm feeling for the first time is intoxicating to me. She took me and she got me undressed. She had me lie on top of her. She showed me all those things that she wanted me to do to her and I liked it. I was like, wow, this is fun. And she gave me a quarter to keep quiet. She kept telling me, this is our secret. Don't tell nobody. So my innocence was taken that day. I lost my innocence that day in the barn. Every chance we would get, Cecilia would take me into that barn and use me to satisfy her desires. And every time she would give me a dime or a quarter after we had finished. After that, every girl I saw, I was trying to get her panties off. I was just a little pervert now. But it's it. What do you mean now? The fucker? Been like that, boy. I was just a little pervert now, but it's interesting. I always think back and wonder when it was that I lost my innocence, and it was then that day. Funny thing about this family, you gotta realize, okay, here I was, I think I was six. I had fought to defend Annie's honor, and I had won from somebody much bigger and older than me. The brother had taken me in a go-kart to a liquor store, and there were newspapers out front, Sunday papers. I remember they had comics out there. I asked Joey, why are those papers out here like that all the time? Are they for free? And he told me, yes, they are for free. Take one. Something told me not to listen to him, but he was older, so he must know. I took one of the newspapers. The store owner came running out. He called the police and everything. I was taken home by the police. So here I had my first crime. So I had defended the honor of the older sister. I had committed my first crime with the brother, and now my first sexual experience was with the younger sister. You would think that that's the weird thing and it stops there, but it doesn't. These people were kind of gypsies and their father was killing a goat one day. They had it hanging upside down. He was cutting his throat. He was drinking his blood straight from the cut and asked me, you want some blood? Drink it, try it, it will make you a man. So I went in and drank the blood. There is a prohibition against drinking blood in the Bible, by the way, but I did not know this. I remember when I drank the blood, I got kind of drunk. Like, you know, I was kind of woozy and lightheaded. I remember going out and kind of stumbling out in the field and passing out, lying down and then waking up, you know, wondering what happened. The grandmother, she used to let me spend the night in her house. Unfortunately, she was into witchcraft so was my mother to a little degree, not realizing what she was really messing with. And all she knew was this kind old lady who actually owned all the property, including our house, adored me and I adored her. It all seemed harmless enough. 
So anytime she asked my mother to let me spend the weekend with her and offer to babysit me, my mother would ask me and of course, I would be begging her to let me stay the night with this grandmother. I loved staying with her because she would bake cookies, cupcakes, muffins, and pies for me. She taught me how to play rummy and we would play cards all night, eat treats, and listen to her records. She treated me like a king and I loved being spoiled by her. She always gave me money and little gifts. She would bathe me and tell me how handsome I was going to grow up to be. Here we go. She would warn me about girls who might try to do nasty things with me because I was so handsome and mature for my age. She even warned me against her own granddaughter, Cecilia, to be careful with her. I remember thinking maybe she knew about Cecilia and me and about the games we played in the barn. But how could she know? I would tell myself, Cecilia and I were always very careful and secretive. Then, after bathing me and drying me off with the towel and putting me in PJs, she would begin adding more water to my bath water left in the tub, saying that she was saving water by bathing in the same bath water. She would take off her robe and get naked in front of me before getting into the tub and would tell me to go wait for her in the living room and watch TV while she bathed. I remember that before Cecilia seduced me in the barn, I never paid attention to the grandmother when she took off her robe and was naked. But after my experience in the barn with her granddaughter, now I wanted to see her naked body. She noticed too, because she would ask me things like if I was frightened by her nudity and if I liked what I was seeing. Then she would tell me, I must never tell anyone ever that I had seen her naked. When she saw how fascinated I was by how thick and hairy her pubic hairs were and how big her breasts and especially her nipples were, she would ask me if I wanted to touch her so I could see that there was nothing to be afraid of. I think this cat's got a fucking fetish with fucking pubic hair, man. I had to promise not to tell my mother or I would never be able to stay there anymore. She let me suck her nipples, asking me if I remembered sucking my mother's breast when I was a baby. She said it would be like the same thing. So I said okay and promised never to tell anyone. She told me that after her bath, she would let me suck her nipples and she would hold me like my mother used to. And it would be like I was her baby too. <laughs> God damn. That night before I went to sleep, she laid on the couch with me holding me and letting me suck her nipple while she hugged me and told me how special I was to her and how this would be our own private secret. I fell asleep with her nipple in my mouth. The warm chocolate milk she had me drink before bed had made me very sleepy. Looking back, I realize now that I always got sleepy after the chocolate milk I drank before bedtime. I think she was drugging me. One night I woke up in the middle of the night I was very groggy, but I remember looking down at my waist. Here we go. She was kneeling beside me and my pajamas were down around my knees. Her face was where my penis was and it was in her mouth. Oh my goodness. She told me to go back to sleep and that I was just dreaming. And because it was her and I trusted her, I fell back to sleep. As I drifted off to sleep, I remember wondering why she had my penis in her mouth. Looking back, it's obvious now she was performing fellatio on me. It was not until many years later that I would even recall these events and all the things she used to do to me when I stayed overnight with her. This woman was into witchcraft and tarot cards, herbs and spells. My mother unwittingly admired this woman because witchcraft was one of the ways of Mexican people and this woman treated my mother really good and always was real nice. She gave her gifts and things, so my mother trusted her with me. And because of the loss of her first son, when this woman would predict great things over me from her tarot cards, my naive mother would just be grateful for her, not realizing the doors that were unwittingly being opened over me in my future. I bring this up because this family really did a lot of things to shake my innocence. Shortly after my sixth birthday, my mother and father were divorced. We went to live in a ghetto in Santa Maria, California, you know, a labor camp. I remember that my mother told me 
You are the man of the house now, so I need you to help me out with your brothers and sisters. I took that very seriously. So here I am now, it's different. Besides the fact that we were living poor, the kids there were a lot tougher and rougher than I was used to. I found that out. On the other side of the fence to the labor camp was the county park. The other side of the park was the country club with the golf course. One of the things that ghetto kids would do would be to shag golf balls. They would sell golf balls that they found back to the golfers. When I found a golf ball, these two older boys around 12 saw me when I was showing off my golf ball. They told me to give them my golf ball. The ball was worth 25 cents. When they told me that, I said, no, I'm not giving you my golf ball. So here they are now beating me up to get my golf ball, choking me out on the ground. I was about to pass out, but I was not about to give up that golf ball. My cousin Jimmy Ray, who was older, happened to come by at that time and he ran those kids off. He was about the same age they were, so thank God he was there. When I got up and told him what happened, that they wanted the golf ball, he explained to me why they wanted it. You know, apparently 25 cents was a lot of money back then. 50 cents was a lot more. Sometimes you could get that for one ball. So I gave it to Jimmy. I said, here, you take the golf ball. All I wanted was a nickel. You know what I mean? So I can get something off the donut truck for cookies or something. Also, it kept him in my good graces so that if I ever needed backup again, and from the look of this labor camp and the toughness of these poor kids, I was gonna need it. I wasn't dumb. I tried to keep my cousin Jimmy Ray on my side, and Jimmy always did look out for me whenever he could. He was always good to me. He was my favorite cousin and always stood up for me and sometimes let me tag along with him. He also would take me to the Junior Park Rangers meetings. He taught me how to say the Lord's Prayer during the meetings. As Junior Park Rangers, we would help by picking up trash around the park and promise to help protect the animals in the park and report any abuse by other park visitors if we saw it. The funny thing about this is that because we were so poor, the park became my hunting grounds to put food on the table. I would post ducks, squirrels, and fish and take them home to my mother to cook to feed all of us kids.